Hey, I want to thank everybody for showing up. Uh, it's an opportunity for me to share my testimony. My name is David Cox, and I want to give you a little bit of background about myself, my education, so that uh, those that don't know me, when I'm going through my testimony, I hope to give some credibility of what I'm telling you. The testimony I'm going to give you is uh, I stand before God and God's creation to tell you I'm telling you the truth, the God, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of what I experienced as um, learning who God was and, and uh, my encounters with God. So um, the, uh, my background a little bit is uh, I do have a, a, a high school diploma. I have two degrees. Um, I'm a certified wellness inspector. i uh, site superintendent, construction inspector. So I have, I have some education. Um, I might not sound like it all the time, but I do. So um, to, just to give you a little background with myself also, my pastor here is uh, Jimmy Babin in uh, New Life Worship Center in New Roads. Uh, one of my favorite teachers as a teacher in the gospel of, of Jesus is uh, Chuck Missler and also uh, Ken Johnson. Two great guys to listen to right at this time right now. They're my favorite. So um, I also believe that the Word of God, the 66 books, are canonized, and that was God's scriptures for us today. The Word of God says of itself, no man but only holy men of God were moved on by the Holy Ghost to give us the scriptures we have. It wasn't of any private interpretation. So when I tell you my testimony, I'm coming from you at right now as someone that's born again, saved, received the baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, and also um, just wanted everybody to know that uh, the gospel is about Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of who Jesus is. I stand before you telling my testimony, letting you know the things about me, about what I'm trying to tell you, where I'm coming from and who I am, that I cannot stand before you and not tell you the truth because uh, I do fear God and uh, ultimately hell. There's no reason in the world why I would stand before you and tell you the things I'm fixing to tell you unless they happened, and they did happen. In times past, I've told my testimony and shared it with people, and on my part, didn't uh, explain well enough and didn't understand exactly what all I experienced to be able to explain it well enough. And I know it's probably been discredited by several pastors by thinking, oh, that don't happen, that can't happen. But I'm telling you, before God I stand, that this does happen and this did happen. And I, I don't think I'm alone, but I think there's a lot of people out there that experience the things of God. So I want to start just saying with that. The, um, and I guess the best way to start is um, explain to you what happened to me. And uh, some of my testimony to me personally is embarrassing. But I got to share some of it to make sure that God gets the glory out of this deal. So you understand my situation, where I was at, and who I was, and what I was doing. We, uh, we were raised by, my, my father died early, but was raised by my mother. So we, we raised up kind of wild, you know, back in the day, you know, lived in uh, the town we lived in. There wasn't much discipline to go on, really. We were really, you know, as kids and growing up, we, we didn't know. Uh, it was kind of like lawless, pretty much. But I'm trying to give you a little background still, because uh, as a child, I went to a Baptist church, and they, they tried to help us as much as they could. They shared the gospel of Jesus with us, and they did a lot for us, and they they um they spoke in our lives, but as a child, I didn't really capture what they was what they were talking about. I didn't understand fully. I knew I had a relationship with God as a child, but uh, took it for granted that everybody had that communication and relationship with God. Got water baptized with my best friend at like 11, 12 years old, and uh, went on in life and just got lost in the world. To, to make a long story short, but uh, a friend of mine, our co-worker, was in a little town in Texas, and uh, he he come up with an idea. Uh, that he knew somebody that had some, some marijuana that he wanted to pick up. And I thought, boy, that was a good idea at the time. You know, who would pass that opportunity up? And it was uh, 10 pounds of marijuana. So we went to get it, and we did pick it up. And when we left, we were stopped. I was in the back seat sleeping. And uh, well, I woke up to a gun pointed about that far from my head telling me, don't move, get out. I really don't know what all happened before that with this guy. I think I was just in the middle of a lot going on that I didn't even know about. However... To make a long story short, they brought us to the jailhouse, to the courthouse, and they put us in this room. It was like a three-story courthouse, and uh, the bottom floor was uh, like they brought us in this room. It was like a gun room. The windows were open. It was a beautiful, fresh air day. Guns were all over the, the walls and on the counters. And uh, I said, man, you know, it was pretty impressive for somebody to like weapons, you know. I mean, this is a nice room. And the only problem was they were accusing us of things that I never even heard of before, and they were accusing us 
for having all these drugs. So as we were standing there, everybody started leaving the room. There wasn't an officer left in the room except this guy and myself. And uh, they left us in this room with all these guns. So I was smart enough to realize, don't do anything because this is your ticket out. They, um, they, they scared us to say the least. Left us like that a while, neither one of us moved. We did not move out of our place. So they started coming back in and uh, went on ahead and booked us. They brought us up three stories to the top floor where there was um, um, a bunch of rooms. This other guy and myself were the only ones in there and all the cells were opened up to each other. And this diagram I drew up here is like the room that, that I was in at the time of my experience. It had one door. There was a, it's like the way they build these uh, old courthouses. You have a wall, and then inside the wall, about two foot from the wall, there's another wall, and that's where the cells are. You break out the cell, you still got that wall to deal with and climb over and whatever. You got two barriers, there, you know, plus having a good cell to stay in. So we, I don't remember how many rooms we had. We probably had eight to ten rooms to ourselves. We had the whole top floor to ourselves. We could walk around from one cell to the other. We had tables. We had the lights in the rooms where you slept were like they had an iron cage on the lights where you could only see a small amount of lights that would come out of this little box to give you light. If you was going to read with good eyes, you would have to hold the book close to you to read. That's how dim the, the lighting was in these rooms. You would go out in the dining area where there was a... Uh, metal tables concreted into the floor and there, were, there was more light out there where you could eat and read you know without with a plenty of light compared to probably wasn't this much light but but a lot more than you know in the bedroom as you would say so we were in there for like five days I'd never been locked up like that in my life so five days is almost like a lifetime it's, it, five days locked up is uh, miserable um, I don't know how people survive mm -hmm. Just something kicks in for survival after you do that but I didn't know this guy that I was with was uh, mixed up in other things too. Um, obviously he was in, mixed up in some kind of cult to where he was uh, with the monks where he make a spirit leave his body and astral project and all this stuff. And uh, I never heard of anything like that. Um, never heard of any kind of uh, sorcery, witchcraft like that. You know, you, except for myths and cartoons and hearsay and folklore that you hear around here. You know, you, you, I never experienced it. But um, after five days we're in there, we would, uh, I mean, you're desperate. If, if you think you can get out of there and it, with no consequences and get off scot-free, that's what you would want to do. So um, he would, uh, what the guy did, he was telling me how to, how to do it, how to make your spirit leave your body. So I listened to him and didn't think too much of it. So he went on one side, the, the, the top of the third floor, like three or four rooms from me, and I went on this side of the, the building in this one room, and laid on this bed in this position here with my head on this end and that end. There was only one way in this room, and that was this doorway right here. And it, you could lock the door if you wanted. They could have locked you in there if they want. But uh, that was left open. All the doors were left open except we couldn't leave the top floor, period. So that's where I went to lay down there. And uh, I thought about what he said, and I thought, man, I don't know what he's talking about, but the only thing I could come back to was Jesus. When I was a kid, I was around a lot of Jesus people, but I was full of foolishness and didn't pay attention, and I was worried about playing and shenanigans and get, you know, just being busy about a child like, like anybody would do. I, I miss God. Although I did all that, God still, I still had a relationship with him to where he talked to me, and I knew when I'd done wrong, and it was a conviction. So he was there in my life, and I took it for granted that God was like that in everybody's life. But I'm saying that to, to let you know, when I laid down in that bed, I didn't try to astral project to make my spirit leave my body or anything. What I did was I, I laid there and I, I, didn't, I didn't even know how to pray. I didn't even remember how to pray. I didn't, uh, didn't know. I really couldn't tell you anything except for, for rumors about what the gospel might really be. That's how much I really picked up growing up. Except for the personal relationship with Jesus, I missed the biblical part of the, the uh, teaching because of uh, just being a child, I guess. So what happened was, I laid down in that bed, uh, and, and this, is the part, this is the part that people have a hard time believing or understanding, but God is my, my witness, I'm telling you the truth. I laid down in the bed, instead of praying to make my spirit leave my body, I started praying to see Jesus. And just like that, I started praying to see Jesus. I laid down in that bed, and my eyes were closed, and it was dark like normal. I opened my eyes, the room was dim, like any other time. Like with the little, they had a cage up there with these little holes drilled in them, and it wouldn't let much light out. 
So I was praying to see Jesus. I crossed my arms over my body like this and I was laying like that with my feet towards the door and there was a space right here between me and the bed probably about three feet. I was laying there like this and I was praying to see Jesus and all of a sudden the room lit up like there was a thousand watt light bulb in there. If My eyes were still closed but I could all of a sudden I could see the room. I could see the other bed. I could see everything in the building. I could see out the door. It was like I wasn't saying anything at that point. I was praying to see Jesus out of ignorance. Just That's the only one I knew was Jesus. So I called on him and I was praying to see him. So when I was doing that, the room lit up like that and I stopped praying. I stopped saying anything and I was just experiencing the room lit up. Like it was like there was no shadows in the room. I noticed like I've never seen a light light up a room like this before in my life. This is this is wild. And, and I, I, you can feel it. But all of a sudden, I felt something coming on me, coming from my right up high, coming down and stood, something came to the, it was an angel, stood at the, the wall, and I could feel his presence. When that happened, I didn't know it was an angel, I just knew somebody just arrived. And I was praying to see Jesus now, but at this time I still wasn't saying anything. So when I, I felt his presence, he walked through the wall, I was watching him, I looked at him, and he was at the end of my feet over here. He was standing, he like walked through the wall and he was just standing there. So, and I knew in my mind, in my heart, this was not Jesus, but I was praying to see Jesus. But he was an angelic, he was, an, he was an angel. I guess the biggest thing that shot me about seeing him was he was the same color of the room as you, if you would, white. And I used to say he didn't have clothes on, but what, I, what I'm saying is he, he wasn't nude. He, had this, he was clothed with this white. He didn't have clothes like we talk about. He didn't have clothes like we wear. He was clothed in the same whatever that light was that he had on him somehow. And when I saw him, he was like seven or eight foot tall. He, was, he stood the room. And I was looking at him, and I was like blown away to say the least, and I'm thinking... You know, I realized what he, what he, what he, what kind of person he was, or what he is. And when I was looking at him, he was looking at me, and the face he had was like, "I don't need you." And if if I could read a face, that's what he was telling me. I don't, I don't need you. And when I was looking at him, he was, uh, he he walked along the side of the bed, and he walked along, started to come past my feet alongside the bed, and he and he was about right there by my feet. When I was looking at him and trying to get all the detail of him, I could because I'm sitting, I'm laying there, can see all this. This is the real thing happening right before me. My eyes are closed, but I can see the room as if my eyes are open and I'm watching an angel walk up to me. And when I was looking at him, the, and this is the part that throws a lot of preachers and Christians off when I tell them, this angel did have, he was mounted. He did have wings. Not like a bird, not like feathers. Whatever, whatever he was, I can't really describe any more than that. And the reason I remember this so accurately is because I was trying to see how he was made. I saw he was like, he, was a, he looked like a warrior. I didn't see weapons, but he was, he was capable of taking care of anything as far as I was concerned just by seeing his stature. When I was looking at him like that and trying to get the detail of him, of him it was like it offended him and it offended God. He turned around walked out, let me just back up, when he was standing there, I could hit the radiant that was on him was hitting my body and I was sitting there basically vibrating. It was like, the, he, and I know now what it is, he came from the presence of God and the glory of God was on him and it was hitting me and I, my body was like in total shock. It was just, if your finger or your foot or your toe could say, hey, I love this, they would have been screaming out. That's, how, that's the only way I can really describe it. But when I offended him and God, he went right back out the wall, and I could tell he was right there because he couldn't couldn't hide his radiant. It was coming through the wall and still hitting me from the other side. And it was all it was like in my mind he like he stooped down, like he was just like just waiting for something. So I started praying to see the angel again. So I started praying to see the angel, and God spoke to me and said, "No, you didn't have this angel. Didn't come in the name of an angel. This angel's not here." To represent himself. God let me know. Do not pray to an angel. You didn't pray to an angel to begin with. You prayed to Jesus. I said yes sir. I'm sorry. So I started praying to see Jesus again. Out of ignorance. I didn't know what else to pray. 
So I started praying to see Jesus again. And I knew this angel was not Jesus. It was automatically known to me. This, this was an angel. This was a created being. He was not godly as far as being a god. And he was not, uh, he was a servant. Is what he is. He's a servant. So I started praying to see Jesus again. And it was like the angel stood up. He put one foot through the wall. And it was like halfway through the wall. And God said, wait. He said, stop. And the angel stopped in his tracks. And God spoke to me again. He said, don't stare him down. Don't look at him like he's looking at him. Let him come do what he can do, what he's going to do, and let him leave. I said, yes, sir. When I said that, he walked through the wall, and I could see him just like I could see all of y'all out of peripheral view. I watched him that way, and I knew that was okay. It was, I just knew it. So he walked through the wall, and when he got beside me, right across from my chest, he walked in there. And he was just like if I stood to the side, I could see you guys out of my peripheral view. That was okay for me to do because I couldn't handle him in a, in a natural man to accept him as a servant. I mean, I was like, I want to give him more honor than that. Just do something else. And I'm, you know what I'm thinking. So God restricted me from being able to even look at him by telling me don't do it. And I said, yes, sir. So I didn't. So I didn't get any more detail of him. That wasn't important at that time. I got enough of him, you know, as far as God was concerned. And I understand why now. So when he walked up beside me, beside my chest, the feeling that I had there was a glorified body in a jailhouse on the third floor, locked up for drugs and a whole lot of stuff. I was experiencing more God than most preachers or Christians have ever had. Now, you know, here I am, everybody in the world would have thrown me away because I was trash. Just like, you know, we all trash without Jesus, but I was trash either way, I was wild. So... That angel was standing there, and what was on him was affecting me so much. I saw he had in his hand a little box, the same color as he was, the same color as the room, and it was a little, it was about, if I had to guess a measurement, it was two by two. It was a square box. He reached down with that square box, stuck it in my chest, went in my chest, I could see all this happening. I was laying there, and I could see it. And he took his hand out, left the box in me, pulled his hand out, turned around, walked out. And I could tell you he went that way fast. He was gone. I was sitting there and I, I was kind of like frustrated and almost even angry in my ignorance. Thank God. He came and stuck something in my chest and left. He didn't say a word. I never heard him say one word, nothing. What? I'm thinking, what is this? You know, I don't know. What is this? I was like discouraged. Just thinking, what? He should have said something, but he didn't. And all of a sudden, I said, ah, I know how to get it back. Lord God, I'm praying to see Jesus. Come on, Jesus. I'm praying for you, Jesus. Laying there. Hey, it happened two times in a row. Three is a strike, right? So I did that. And the, the light of the room, it kind of done like a swirl. And it, it made a real small hole in a wall. And God told me, he said, get up and look in this hole and get all the details you can. I said, yes, sir. I got up, but I, my flesh stayed in the bed. I, my spirit man, unbeknown to me, stood up when I said, yes, sir. Stood up, walked up to this wall with a, a, maybe a three-eighths hole in it. And God told me, he said, get all the detail of this you can. So I, when I did, I got up, I went and looked in the hole, and I could see colors and clouds. And clouds were moving. And the clouds were like coming from my left to my right. And they were like rolling. And they were all colors. They were beautiful. Like nothing I can, colors I can't describe. Colors I've never seen again. I can tell you that the natural man would fall on his knees and raise his hands when you see heavenly clouds. That's, that's how it affects you. That's, that's how pretty heaven's clouds are. That's what I experienced. So when I'm doing this, looking at all the detail of these clouds moving, all of a sudden from my right, something started entering in the picture. Only, but while I was thinking and looking through there, I was thinking, boy, the clouds look like this. What must the land look like? Where are the people? Where are they at? Boy, I was in that hole. And I know why God made me on the wall and put a little hole. Because I'm about to pop my eyeballs out trying to see other things besides what was in that hole. I'm, I'm thinking, the land's got to be amazing if the clouds are like this. So I'm trying to see if I see somebody or see some land, see some, you know, I'm just looking for anything. I just want to see more than clouds. I'm trying to see some, because he told me I can look. You know, I was, it was okay for me to get all the detail of this I could. So the cloud 
it was flowing this way, and there was a pillow like you lay your head on, a pillow, a big giant gold pillow with a king's crown in it. A big gold pillow with a king's crown in it. And, and as it started floating in the picture across that little hole where I could see it, God said, get all the detail of it you can. So I was looking at it. It had writing on it. I couldn't tell you what it said, nothing on it. Probably Hebrew, you know, knowing what I know now. It's, it, there's no telling, heavenly language. It might have been my crown. Who knows? I don't know. But I was looking at it, getting all the detail of this crown that I could. And as the crown crossed over the hole, it never stopped. It kept moving the whole time. And God gave me different angles to look at. So I would look at it. it would, you know, somehow, even through the hole, I was still getting different angles to look at it. And it never stopped moving. Inside the crown was the weirdest thing to me. And uh, a lot of times I'm reluctant to even say what I saw because, it, it, you know, I'm worried about what people think or say sometimes, I guess. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to lose people track of them. And God uses different things for each one of us differently is all I can say. But inside the crown was like, if you go to the doctor's office and they show you a picture of a brain, you know, like I'm talking about, you, this is what you look like on the inside, on the other side, that skull, that, that skull you got there. And it was like there was a brain in there. And I was looking at it, and I was thinking, I was praying to see Jesus. I remember that well. And I thought, there's a crown, there's a pillow, and there's a brain in it. And I said, is that Jesus? I didn't know. It wasn't discerned to me to know what that was. I said, is that Jesus? Is that all they left to him? Because, you know, I do remember hearing stories that he got killed and uh, he died, you know, so he done some other things. And, I mean, you know, I'm going through the list of my own little mind, what I can remember. I'm trying to put together, is this Jesus? Is this all that's left to him? So it floated on across. When I couldn't see it anymore, the hole closed like normal, and it was dark like normal, and I jumped up from there, and I wanted to go find that dude that was into that cult stuff. I didn't know it was cult stuff then, but he was in that... Uh, Eastern religion stuff. I ran to look for him to find him, and he had already come my way. And when I ran into him, he asked me, man, what happened to you? He was like blown away. He said, you white as a ghost, dude. I said, wait, there's more. Let me tell you why. So I told him why. And here you are sitting in jail thinking, did that really just happen? Then the human, human brain start kicking in and start denying and I think, no, no, I know what just happened, man. I'm telling you. I'm telling you what just happened. This is undeniable. I jumped up from there, told him what happened. Uh, like a day later, a preacher showed up. They wouldn't let him in there because we were too dangerous, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so a preacher, we're looking through this little hole, and I said, hey, man, let me tell you what happened. A little preacher couldn't relate to me. He, he probably was a good little guy. I don't even remember. He might, might have been the God sent best little preacher in the world. Who knows? But because he couldn't answer to anything I told him, I blew him off. I said, man, you, see you later, Gator. So he left. Two days later, we got out after being locked up for seven days. And God is my witness. We got locked up and set free. And this ain't even on my record. There was a lot of stuff going on I didn't know about. Thank you, Jesus, for being locked up in a gun room and wanting to kill me and all that stuff. And think back and thank you, Jesus, for all these crooked things and I believe in supporting the law, God, country, everything. I, you know, but uh, it's nice when you when you God sees you mess ups and He knows you can have a clean slate and He wants to clean your slate up to where you can function in life and do and be later on. But after that experience, we got out of there seven days later, and here I go, scot free, never quit anything I was doing. In fact, probably enjoyed it more. I got away with this one. That, and I would tell this story every now and then. But it wasn't like I would tell it often because people would think you're crazy. The only time I would tell this story that I just told you would be when somebody would tell me some crazy story about a UFO or something. I said, wait a minute, I got one for you. Let me tell you mine. <laughs> so I didn't understand mine like I understand it now. But at, I got these scriptures up here as a reference. I'm not going to go through them, but it's something that you can go through and look at one day and, and, and or even do a, a Google search or do a Strong's Concordance search on angels and uh, how they encounter with, uh, with mankind from Genesis to Revelations. They're not dead. They're alive. God's, God's, God's going to meet every one of us where we're at. So when, whenever that happened, I would tell my testimony every now and then, like I said, with people that, you know, they tell me something crazy, I give them one back. So to, make a, to move on in my testimony, there's a lot more that happened, but a, as I went on in life few li a couple of years later passed by I would uh, I was wild to the max uh, I'd started dating my wife that I have now Kara and uh, 
I'll throw this in there to give you an idea where I was at. Uh, I was riding down the road one day, and I saw a couple of my friends. On Their car was in the road with the hood up. I looked down the gravel road, uh, probably two or three hundred yards. They were way over there. I thought they were fighting. So I went over there to stop them from fighting or whatever they were doing. The car was on the highway. They were way over there. I pulled up to them and said, what are y'all doing, dude? Y'all fighting? No, man, we're trying to blow that car up. I said, the, the one I just drove by, right, with the hood up? Uh, they said, yeah. I said, well, how'd y'all do it? They said, well, we put gas all over the motor. We unplugged one of the wires. We left it running, and we waiting for it to ignite. I said, that's not how you do that. So I got it. So I pulled off there. I knew they wasn't fighting anymore. I pulled off from there, went by the car, got some paper I had in my car, lit it, rolled down the window, threw it out the window on the motor, car Car went on fire. I went on. Carrie didn't know all this stuff. She was the she was the innocent one, and I was the wild one there. I went on to Carrie's, stayed there a while. Didn't think nothing of it. It wasn't gonna mention it, you know. I didn't. It's just a common way of life. That's the things we did. You know, it's like no big deal. That was another one that we burned up, kind of deal, you know. But went on about our business and uh, stayed with Carrie a little while. Left Carrie's house, man. I'm riding home like cool dude like I thought I was. Smoking my weed and smoking my cigarettes and doing, you know, just living the life. And uh, my car run out of gas. And my car started coasting. And it was just impressed on me. Let this car coast as far as it can. And whenever you just can't go no more, just pull it right off the road. You know, and then at least I, you, you don't have to walk so far. It made sense to me. And plus there was a graveyard right back there. I don't want to run out of, I don't need to, uh, run out of gas right here, that helped me get up there a little further. So I'm gonna let this thing roll. You know, dark time, graveyard, don't go together with smoking dope, you hear me? <laughs> so I, I coasted on past the graveyard and uh, it started coming to me real clear that where that I lit that car on fire, I'm getting close to it. And it was pressed on me, don't touch the brake. Guess where I stopped? No, I opened the door and looked on it and I was on top of the burnt spot. God said, I had enough for you. I had enough. I said, yes, sir. I went on about my business, got me some gas, and, and I remember that depression. God didn't do me anything right there. Them guys probably didn't even have car insurance to make it worse. You know, they, they were trying to do it to burn it. It doesn't pay to smoke dope. Don't, don't smoke dope. You burn your car up for no reason. But wait a minute. I don't have insurance. Well, you can't collect insurance on it now, can you? Sorry. But, but anyway, the, uh, let me see. We, after that happened, I would tell Karen my testimony. Because, you know, my fiance, we ended up getting married. And uh, we, uh, I'm going to go through it. I'm going to skip a few things here. But to, to speed up the process here, to, um, I, I just want to say, I would tell care of this testimony and I'd tell a few select individuals this testimony. And uh, I was a construction worker and uh, I came home one day and uh, I was, uh, the I remember the first television I ever had with a remote on it. I was flipping the channels and I landed on a preacher talking about getting saved, getting born again, getting filled with the Holy Ghost. And I said, like, get the Holy Ghost? So what is that? I never heard about getting the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues and everything. And, so when I heard that, it really captured my mind. I flipped the channels, and I think I landed on something like the Lone Ranger, some old Western, and I was sitting there watching it. And I thought, you know, if, if this guy's right about all this, my recollection back, way back when, when I used to go to church as a kid, I never heard any of that. I, I would like to know what that's about. And I didn't know it then, but God was started drawing me at that point. So I would go to work, and I was just like everybody else. Um, they didn't do drug tests back then, you know, back back when we was doing this stuff, like smoking uh, weed and everything. But um, when I would pass the church every now and then, I would think, I, you know, I know a bunch of Catholics, when they pass the church, they do this hand thing, and I thought, that's probably pretty cool. I don't know what that is, but I don't know what they're doing, and I don't know how to do it. So when I'd pass the church, I'd just say, I'd just tell God, say, I love you, God. So I would do that every now and then, and I, so I tried to make that a habit. That was my religious thing. That's what I would do. Me and God tight, right? We got, I pass the church, I'm going to tell you, hey, I love you. Everything else is okay, but when I pass the church, I love you. <laughs> you know, do whatever you got to do. So, I, t I told Carrie the story, and this, this is the God's honest truth. I'm sitting, fixing to tell you again. I was sitting there, 
And I told God, I said, I couldn't live for you if I wanted to. And God said, why not? I said, because we got a problem. I smoke weed, I love it. I smoke cigarettes, I love it. Everything I do, I like. But even if I wanted to quit, I can't. I smoke two packs of cigarettes on a good day, and if I go out drinking and partying, I bet you I drink, smoke five, six packs of cigarettes. Easy. And in my mind, now, if, if somebody here smokes, don't take this as an offense or anybody smokes because God beats everybody different. So I'm thinking, God said, I told him, I said, I couldn't live for you if I wanted to because I couldn't quit these things because I thought in order to be a Christian, you couldn't do any of this stuff. In my mind, there's no option. I can't. I can't be a Christian and do these things. Although I know there are Christians that do those things, but they meet God at a different place in a different world. But my world, being I'm a fanatic about things and I see things one way, in order for me to get saved and live for Jesus, I can't do this. It's an absolute. There's no options. That's the way I'm made. Some of us are made like that. Some of us are not. You deal with it. Face it. You, you know, God got to meet you where you're at. So he had to meet me at a level maybe different than you. Because the only way I could live for God is if he met me there and fixed it. The only way. So I told God I couldn't live for you if I wanted to because of all this. He said, I can take that away from you. I said, yeah, I bet you could take it away from me. You could kill me. You could give me cancer. You can give me some kind of disease and I'll have to quit. I know you can do it. There ain't no doubt in my mind. I wasn't being ugly to God, but I thought God was the one going around killing people. I thought God was responsible for giving you cancer and sickening you and, and dealing with you like, like all this miserable, sick stuff in the world. I blame God for it. I thought, God, you killed my daddy. You killed this. You did this. You are part of this. You let all this happen. That's all you. God knew what, where I was coming from, and I wasn't being ugly, ugly. I was being honest, what I thought. I didn't know. I was deceived. God told me, he said, I said, I couldn't live for you if I wanted to because I, like, I not only like all these things, I'm hooked on them. He said, I can take them away from, them, from you, and I heard what you said, and I can take it away from you without hurting a hair on your head. I still got a few. Back then, I had a lot more. I had a lot of hair. A mess. He said, I can take it all that away from you without hurting a hair on your head. That was like shock to me. I'm thinking, I never heard this. I mean, me and God's right here on my couch in a trailer park. Kara's in the kitchen about the distance she is now, about 20, 30 feet from me. Me and God's having this conversation. Here I am, smoking weed. Smoking weed don't make you have hallucinations or encounters with God. I want y'all to know that. Smoking weed just makes you stupid. Besides that, it don't cause godly encounters. I want to put that out there first because some people are ignorant about marijuana. Marijuana will destroy your life. If you start, smoke, start smoking at 15 and until you're 30, you can still be 15 at 30. But anyway, I told God, I said, God, I couldn't live for you if I wanted to. He said, I'll take it away from you without hurting a hair on your head. I said, well. He said, not only that, he said, I can put something in the place of it. I said, what you going to put in the place of that? What are you going to put in a place of smoking dope, smoking cigarettes, and doing all the... I was a wild child. I liked the bars. I liked running around. I was, you know, I loved that stuff. That's what I did. He said, I can take it away and put something in the place of it. I said, oh, man, first you tell him you can take it away. Without hurting the hair on my head, I kept throwing that in. Make sure he knows that. He said, without hurting the hair on my head, that means without giving me cancer, disease, and killing me, or whacking me and to, to help me stop all these drugs and stuff I'm doing. He said, I can put something in a place of it. He said, not only that, he said, I can take it away without you missing it. I said, there ain't no way. First, you tell him you can take it away. I believe that. Second, you tell him you can take it away without hurting me. And third, you can take it, a place, take it away from me without me missing it. That's impossible. I said, but I tell you what, if you can do that, let's see. I challenged him. Flat out challenged God. The nerve of me. I said, because I was challenging him to his word, not disrespectful. I was re talking to him and he was communicating to me some old trash, filthy as a dirty rag, honest with God, God honest with me, God will meet you where you're at. I don't care what anybody says. You got preachers and you got Christians who would have thrown me away. And I would have blamed him. It looked bad. It was a bad, bad case. But God had other plans. He knew the future. I said, first you can take it away without hurting me. Second, you can put something in the place of it. And third, you can take it away without me missing it. Let's see. So I went on about my business, 
Didn't care, tell Carrie anything at that time. This is, a, you know, how you, I've, I've experienced my life talking to God like that. It wasn't no big deal, you know what I mean? It's like, he never, he never forsook me. He always stayed there, I, and I was stupid. I thought everybody was like that. I didn't know. I had no idea what I was doing to Jesus, you know, taking him and doing the things I was doing. But anyway, when after that happened, I, I went on about my business like me and God never said nothing like usual. I heard what he heard, said. I remember what I said, and I would think about it. And uh, went on about watching TV, went on about work. And uh, I was probably one of the wildest iron workers at work. I was uh, uh, tied rebar and hung iron. You know, we did all kind of stuff out there. But um, after that, it was like a week or two later, I got invited to go to church. And I told Kara, I said, let's try it. So we went to church, and the preacher drew on a board a crown. He drew on a board a big crown. And when he drew that crown on there, you know, and, and, I'm, and like I said, I'm, I'm skipping a few things, but when we came, this, this ultimately started happening. We, we, would, uh, we would come and we would listen to what the preacher had to say and we were learning about what that crown was. And uh, how when Satan fell, I mean, excuse me, when Adam and Eve fell, they were righteous, but they gave up their righteousness, their crown of righteousness, they had dominion over everything, but when they fell, Satan came with authority. And then, then here we are. We're born in sin. That's where that comes from. We lost our righteousness from birth. When you're born into this world, you're born in unrighteousness. You're born in sin. You, you're safe until the age of accountability, and only God knows where that's at with each person. And then you're born, you have to do something about getting right in order to, to make heaven. So... The uh, let me back up just a little bit. After the invite to church, I came home one day from work. This is truth. God is my witness. This happened. I have to say that. I came in from work. I had started smoking dope. I was sitting there. Carrie was doing something in the kitchen. I was sitting back on my couch watching TV, probably a cowboy show or something. Yeah, I think it was Lone Ranger actually. And uh, I was sitting there. And all of a sudden, a buzzing started happening in my ear. Like, bzzz. And I thought the buzzing was in, the, was, this, was in this ear right here. So I'm sitting there thinking this bug is in my ear trying to get it out. And uh, so I told Kara, I said, man, I got a bug or something in my ear. I can't get it out. It's making this buzzing noise in my ear. She said, well, she told me a story about a brother having a bug in his ear. And they put some water in his ear to try to flush it out. So I thought, I'm going to try that. that we got to do something. This thing's buzzing. So we put water in my ear and tried to drown that bug or whatever it was in my ear. I held my breath as long as I could, so I'm thinking whatever's in there can't be holding his breath that long. So pick up my head, try to get the buzz out of my ear, but the buzz don't quit. So Kara's about a business in there doing what she does in the kitchen, and I'm sitting in there dealing with, I'm trying to smoke a joint in peace for one thing. And then this thing, this all this buzz is messing me up. So I, w I was praying. I would. I, this buzzing was just happening in that ear. So I told Carrie. So then the buzzing started sounding like it was in this ear. I said, "Wait a minute. I think we put water in the wrong ear. <laughs> I, um, I think I think it's on this side. So we tried to put drown the bug on this side. And I held my head like that long as I could. I held my breath long as I could, thinking, well, this got to drown it this time because I'm going to keep it over a little longer. Pick up my head. I'm thinking, that didn't bother it because, it's hey, this might be a water bug. <laughs> this thing, you, you can't drown this dude. So she went on about her business in the kitchen. So I'm sitting there. I'm thinking, Tara, can you hear this? I mean, at this point, somebody else should be able to hear this thing because it's loud. It's buzzing like crazy. She said, no. I said, well, I'll tell you what. This thing is loud. So I was sitting there, Carol went about a business, and God spoke to me. He said, I know how you can get rid of it. I said, how? He said, get all that dope you have and go burn it. I said, yes, sir. He said, go burn it. I grabbed that dope, went outside, and used to have a big barrel out there to burn this stuff. So I put that dope in the barrel and tried to burn it. It wouldn't burn. He said, you got something in the house that would help it burn. I had some clothes that wasn't appropriate to wear with certain writings on it and pictures. So I went and got those 
that stuff, and he brought that to my memory because I wasn't thinking of that stuff. So I went and got that, put it in there, put some gas on it, burned everything. The ringing never stopped. I started walking back to where we were staying at in the trailer house, and I started walking up the steps, and I was reaching for the door, and it stopped. Zip. God told me, he said, if you ever need to smoke dope again or have any issues again, you call upon my name in Jesus' name and you won't have a desire, you won't have a temptation to be gone immediately. Oh, I said, yes, sir. Never smoked no more dope. Step kept coming to church here, getting a little educated, learning, learning what the scriptures say about life, getting born again water baptized and the baptism of the Holy Ghost and all that stuff. And uh, I went to work. I had, I had a, I've been smoking cigarettes for a long time. Probably since I was 12 years old. Uh, I always had access to cigarettes and my mother ran a restaurant for a while and we had access to everything, just anything we wanted. Dr for smoking and drugs and alcohol and all that. I went to work with a pack of cigarettes with me in case I wanted one. Never even wanted one. And I'm talking somebody that smoked two packs a day. Never smoked another cigarette. God set me free from smoking cigarettes that way too. And then as you go and tell your testimony, as you try to share what people what God has done in your life, it sounds like wow. Sounds like you know heavy stuff. I have scriptures here, just a few. You know the scriptures talk about a lot of um a lot of angels, angelic experiences that from Genesis to Revelations that people have. And I know as I run into people and watch on YouTube and other places, people talk about their, their experience with God. Some of them, are, you know, you got to be sensitive to who you're listening to perhaps, cause, but some of them just like, like they're wild. But if you have a testimony, if you have an experience with God, it will line up with the Word of God. Everything that I experienced, that crown of righteousness, that, that little box. I got one more story I got to share with y'all. God is my witness. This is the truth. I'm telling you the truth of what I'm fixing to tell you. We came here. We received, we received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We learned about the devil. How we, we, we have authority over him. We, heard, we learned how we can rebuke him. And we learned how to, to survive as a Christian by just knowing a few things after about three or four months of teaching here. Teaching in the Word of God. One day, I was telling Kara, I even told a preacher one time, I said, you know, I, tried to, I told him my testimony a little bit real quick about this crown and this box. And, and what he told me was, well, God give it to you, you find out. So I said, you know, I'm going to take that advice. I knew what the crown was because that was, the Bible talks about the crown of life and the crown of righteousness. You have a crown, if you save living for Jesus, you have a crown of life and a crown of righteousness given to you. You have it. You already have it. You already own it. You already been. The Bible said, the Word of God said that salvation is a gift from God. If it's a gift, you can't do anything for it, right? Except Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. That's the gift, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life. I knew that. But I did not know what that little white box was that angel stuck in my chest and turned around and left. So I went to my. Kara was uh, in the kitchen again or something. I came in from work. I got on my bed in, the, in, the, in this trailer house. It only had one door, and it was to my left. The bed was up against the wall over here to the, to the outside. So I started, I just got, went in my bedroom, and I started praying, Lord God, just, I don't know what this little white box is. You know, I know the devil's pretty slick. He's a deceiver. If this white box is not you, I would ask you to get it out of me. If it's of you, open it, or tell me something, or give me, open it, or get it out of me. Or tell me what it is, or give me a bone that you on to satisfy me, because I got to know what this is. I don't know what this is. I still don't know what this is. I was telling him. So as I was, I kneeled down and I was on the side of my bed, talking like this and praying to God. You know, communicating and talking to God is praying, right? That's what I was doing. All of a sudden, that room lit up just like that jailhouse did that time. A bright light. I mean, there was a sh no shadows to be found in the room. And for some reason, that angel came from the same direction. He came through the back of the trailer and stood there. He stood there like this with his arms crossed. I didn't stare him down, but I could look at him because I was mature enough to understand who he was and what he was. He was a servant. He was a servant of God. If an angel come to you and he let you worship him, 
You, you have just been introduced to a demonic individual. So I didn't know all that then. But if you have any kind of spiritual encounters and they, and they accept worship or praise, you, you're dealing with the wrong bunch. They're they from the wrong side. If an angel, a, a man of God, is not going to accept worship from you. None of them. They're all created beings. Only God alone, Jesus, is who we worship. But that angel walked through the walls, put his arms like that. He looked at me, I looked at him, and he looked across the room, across the, in the far corner of the bedroom where I was standing. And so I kept, he kept doing that two or three times, and so I looked over there. And in that corner was a ball, a sphere. It was like an orb. You know, I used to call it a ball that was in a sphere, and it was contained, and I couldn't tell what it was contained in it. You can't see anything that's, that's making it a sphere, but it was like a cloud was in it, and it, it, was, it was activity in this thing. And I didn't know anything about orbs back then. So I called it the ball, and it was like, and, that, and as it came toward me, it got bigger. And when it got about a foot and a half, two feet away from me, I would look at the angel, and I would look at it, and the angel never moved, never uncrossed his arm, just stood there watching. And in that, that, out of that sphere, that orb came out of, there's an arm that came out of it, went in my chest, just like that angel's arm and hand did. He put his hand on that white box, I could see the box. It was in there. And he had his hand on it. And that, and that thing in that orb said, I'm going to take your righteousness. I'm going to take your gift. And you know, I was already ready to re rebuke the devil. I learned that much. I can get rid of the devil. So, And I started to say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. But them devils, they watch him. They know what you're fixing to do. He's trying to get out of Dodge quick. He was pulling his hand out and it was empty. The angel never moved. His arms were still crossed. And I said, uh, and as he pulled his hand out, he, know, he knew I was saying, no, you're not taking anything. I'm not doing what Adam and Eve did. I'm not giving you anything. God gave that to me. I realized, you're not taking it. He pulled his hand out empty, and then I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I don't know what happened to him, but I can tell you he went in a bunch of different directions at one time, and I never saw that one again. Don't know what happened, but I know he left my presence as fast as he could. The angel never said a word turned around, went through the wall, and I could tell where he went. The room got dark like normal, my eyes closed, and I was, you know, telling these stories, and after I get, you know, started learning what my testimony was, and what really happened to me, and how God was trying to draw me, you got people, you got thousands of people that saw Jesus, and went to hell. I was praying to see Jesus, praying to see Jesus don't get you into heaven. Accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior get you to heaven. That's how you see Jesus. You got to receive the crown of life. I was praying to see Jesus. God was showing me for because He knew this day was coming. I will be able to tell people when when you call upon Jesus, you gonna get to see Jesus. But you get to see Him through the righteousness by living righteous. You will get to see Jesus. But accepting Him as your Lord and Savior is how you get to see Jesus. That's how we're gonna get to stay with Him throughout eternity. I was telling this testimony at my mother's house one day. And I said, you know, I still don't know what that little white box is. Everybody in the room started laughing at me. And, and, it, and, I, and I was just, just didn't get it. That devil told me what it was. He was trying to steal it. My gift of righteousness. Come on. When you get saved, guess what? He used a little two-by-two -two box. If that's what a gift of righteousness is and it's a two-by-two -two box in me, you have one too. Because without it, we, have, we don't have salvation. So my testimony not only lines up with the Word of God, I think the only thing that really throws people that are in the ministry, because the Bible don't talk about angels with, say, one set of whatever he had on him. It wasn't like he, it's an angel walking around with wings like this, though. This, when this guy walked in this room and I was looking at all the detail of him I could, I was looking up in here, and that guy had some kind of mount that I would guess would have some kind of connection with wings, but it's not like, like we know. It's not like feathers that I saw. It's like whatever those, whatever he is made of, those were too. Whatever that is, that's, that's the only way I can answer that. Um, but I know that in a, in a years ago when I try to tell my testimony, I know I've even had pastors tell me, angels don't have wings. Well, you been there? Have you been there a while looking around in heaven? What do you know they have, whether they have wings or not? I know the seraphim and cherubim have wings. I know that all of them that the Bible talked about came to Abraham and walked through at the times of uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and they didn't have wings mentioned. 
There's a lot of it. The Bible says we'll have angels amongst us and we won't even know it. You better be careful how you treat people. That ragged old guy, that old woman might be an angel in disguise. They, they undoubtedly can, uh, I want to say, transform whatever they need to do or be. That's beyond our understanding. Jesus walked through a wall. He ate. That's God. Jesus is God. Y'all realize that? Jesus is the Son of God. He's God. He is God. He's part of the Trinity. He is God. Jesus is God. Jesus, God cared enough about us to come in this world and do what He did for us to, to, for this to happen. So, and I know this is extraordinary testimony and stuff, and, you know, a story to tell. God is my witness. This is the truth. This is what happened to me. The, uh, after, after that encounter with, uh, with in the trailer house, and I learned what, the, what, what all my testimony did mean, as I get to Strong's Concordance or any kind of uh, study, that I do research on the crown of righteousness, the gift of righteousness, angels. The Bible's full of it. I don't doubt in my mind one bit that some of you guys have some supernatural experiences too. A lot of people get, uh, uh, you know, well, I never had anything happen to me. Well, maybe you wasn't in a place and circumstances didn't cause you to have to have that happen. God, is it 2 Peter 3 9, says, God's not slack concerning his promises, but he's in long suffering willing that none of us would miss Him, but all of us would find eternal life in Him. That's what, it, and I'm paraphrasing what it says, but that's what He's saying. His will is that, although I would have been thrown away by everybody that known me, and rightly so, I, I deserved it, as a filthy rag, not living for Jesus. But uh, Jesus, you know, when you're born in this world, you're a filthy rag too. You're not worth anything either, except for the mercy of God and His righteousness. So the gift of righteousness, the crown of righteousness, the gift of righteousness. And I want to say this to end. John 6.44 and John 15.16 has a lot to say. If you look at what it's saying, that anybody that want to live for Jesus, anybody that has a desire to even know about God, is only because God is drawing you to Him. Jesus Himself said, unless the Father draw you to Him, He said to me, being Him, He said nobody would even want to live for me. The Father, you have to be chosen first. And He draws you to Him. Then you accept Him. And then you welcome to the new world of a Christian life. And then you're not perfect. Boy, you have a lot of things to work through. From the time you get saved to the time you pass away, it don't end. God's going to be training you and teaching you. And you're going to be learning and growing. I hope. Should be. That's why I like listening to preachers that uh, make me uh, just awesome to listen to. And you, you hear people like... Uh, Chuck Missler and Ken Johnson is just awesome teachers to hear, hear them talk about what they're talking about to help us understand the Bible the way we do. And it's important to have a pastor. We have a pastor here, Jimmy Babin. That guy's the best pastor I ever sat under. He's a real pastor. He's a pastor's heart. And uh, so I just want to end with that and to let you guys know uh, to get born again, to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's it. 